Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of Morgan Bazilian, co-chair of the uh, Electric Power Working Group and me, David Victor, uh, pleased to welcome you to this event by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network connected to the release of the ZCAP report, the Zero Carbon Action Plan report. Uh, the release was yesterday. It's all online. I think the video, the videotape of it, or whatever the technology is that has memorized the, the presentation, is online. The idea behind ZCAP is to uh, present a vision of how um, the United States could get to zero by 2050, uh, a goal that is net zero by 2050, a goal that is consistent with um, widely discussed international goals and would be the American contribution to a global strategy for, for helping to stop uh, climate change. And um, several studies have been really are being released right now, um, and that's very important. The ZCAP project is aiming to have internal consistency by modeling uh, what is being done across the economy or could be done across the economy, um, to look at what needs to happen in terms of policies and regulations, to look at the impacts on employment, um, and, uh, uh, and then also to look in depth at, at six major sectors. Uh, one of them is the electric power sector, uh, which is the one that we're talking about today. And there'll be webinars, an hour long webinars on each of those sectors uh, over the course of the coming days. Um, if you could uh, put to the next slide, please. Uh, just one slide to show you the nature of the challenge. Uh, the power sector in the United States uh, has uh, already seen significant, de uh, significant decarbonization as a result of the shift from coal to natural gas, courtesy of uh, large supplies of low cost uh, uh, um, shale gas, along with the spread of renewables uh, into the electric power system uh, in the United States. And so we've seen, if you like, a, a kind of shallow decarbonization, a reduction in the carbon intensity, the CO2 per kilowatt hour generated, as shown here on this chart in the orange, historically, uh, of about 20%. What's needed for deep decarbonization, so getting to zero, is that and then some, accelerating what we've seen historically, um, and then eventually getting to essentially zero. And that's what we're gonna be talking about um, uh, today. Um, before we go through uh, each of the major elements of the, the, the vision that we've laid out here, which is designed to complement the modeling work, but really give a lot of granularity as to which technologies, what are the uncertainties, what are the kinds of policies that could matter, um, uh, I want to hand the floor over to my uh, uh, co-convener, uh, Morgan Bazilian, who's going to say a few uh, introductory remarks, and then we're going to go off and first talk about the decarbonization of supply. Morgan? David, thanks very much. Uh, and I'd just like to thank the uh, UNSDSN team for, for a job really well done pulling this all together and congratulate them on the, the wider report that came out, as David said. We're going to focus today's hour on uh, the power sector, and we have some terrific um, people speaking about four different sections. So we're going to have a closer look at the decarbonization of supply, then look at uh, demand for electricity, uh, followed by evolution and grid typology. And then uh, finally, before Q&A session, we'll have a session on policy and markets. So um, in order to move quickly through this uh, agenda, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jacqueline Dowling, and she is going to discuss uh, the decar decarbonization of supply. And Jackie, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm Jackie Dowling. I'm a PhD student at Caltech. And this section of the um, document was um, had contribu contributions from Jeff Logan and Brian Taroha. Um, and we'll be talking about decarbonization, decarbonization of supply. So several states have mandated 100% carbon-free electricity systems by mid-century already. Um, there are about eight states that have um, these 100% carb carbon-free um, standards or goals or mandates. Um, uh, these are mandates for these eight states besides Nevada. Um, and there are 13 other states that are considering analogous um, uh, standards or goals. Um, and within these carbon-free mandates, many states have um, capacity requirements for technologies such as wind and solar, um, which are renewable. Um, California, for example, has a 100% uh, clean electricity goal by 2045, but has a 
requirement to have 60% of the electricity sector be supplied by renewables by uh, 2030. So um, different states, some states have 100% renewable targets and some states have 100% clean targets. And those have different implications on what technologies would be allowed to meet these targets. Um, next slide, please. So what I mean by, um, so generation technology options in the electricity sector can be grouped by policy definition. Um, some, um, uh, as I showed in the, in the image before, there's um, this kind of renewable definition that's defined by uh, states' renewable portfolio standards, um, but then uh, some states, or some technologies fall into this kind of clean category. Um, which may contribute to net, z net zero carbon electricity targets in some states. Um, and so renewable um, primarily means wind and solar, but it also includes um, geothermal, um, small hydro, and then um, clean, uh, clean hydrogen and trash gas. Um, whereas clean includes more like um, nuclear, hydro, um, possibly natural gas with CCS. This is being debated about whether or not that can be included, um, but um, these are technologies that are clean, but haven't, um, but aren't explicitly renewable. So next slide, please. Um, so it's important to know that um, one, no one size fits all clean electricity technology is available for all 50 states. Um, different states have access to different resources. So this map is from EIA and I've, um, uh, layered all some of the power plants that would count as clean. Um, and so in the Northwest, there's a lot of hydro. Southwest, there's a lot of solar. In the Midwest, um, there's a lot of wind. And so this would make, helps make sense why some states have 100% clean targets versus renewable targets. Um, Washington, for example, already has um, 70, already meets 70% of its electricity demand with hydro. So it has a 100% clean goal by mid-century, for example. Um, next slide. So we can also group generation technology um, by, their, by the functional role that they play on the grid. So variable renewables um, include wind and solar. And these types of um, generation sources are intermittent, and you can't control when you have them. It's based on weather. Um, whereas firm and dispatchable are um, can provide bulk load and you can have them kind of, you can control when you, when you will use them. Um, and those include nuclear, hydro, geothermal. Um, these are kind of like, can provide bulk power. Um, and then the third category is capture or carbon capture. And that includes um, carbon capture utilization and storage, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, uh, where you're, um, using, but all, you're using carbon for fuel, but also sequestering it. So um, next slide. So then um, we've, in the section, we've basically um, categorized these three, we've taken these three functional roles, variable, renewable, energy, dispatchable, and capture, and given them basically um, technology readiness levels or um, how they compare and shown how they compare in cost. So variable renewable energy is currently low cost and are project, projected to be um, even lower in 2050. They have, um, they have fixed costs, but they have very low or, or no um, variable costs. There's no fuel costs with um, wind and solar. Um, nuclear or some of the dispatchable um, have higher upfront costs, can be very high upfront costs, um, but they also have long lifetimes and um, relatively inexpensive um, fuel costs, but they also can have um, ecosystem conflicts and um, uh, siting concerns. Um, so, and then the carbon capture is also kind of a um, less mature, or is, is a less mature um, area of high, current high costs right now. Um, and you can read this section for more detail. I don't have time to go all the way in, but okay, next slide. So if um, variable renewable um, electricity resources are very, um, uh, are low cost and mature technologies, um, we would recommend that states build um, wind and solar dominated systems, but they also have to deal with the variability that wind and solar have. And um, 
this study shows that basically um, there are over a 39 year data set from a NASA um, weather uh, model. Uh, we see uh, the, some problems with wind and solar that include seasonal lows in wind power during the summer and um, wind and solar resource droughts that can last uh, um, five days um, in the US um, and also interannual variability where on the same day of the year, you could have much more or much less um, uh, wind power. So next slide. So um, wind and solar alone are only about 80% reliable. Um, it is about, it is, um, current understanding shows that it's feasible to get to about 80% reliability with just wind and solar, but you need other enabling technologies to make wind and solar systems fully reliable because the North American um, Reliability Electric, Electric Reliability Corporation um, requires greater than 99.97% reliability, which is um, less than a blackout, less than one blackout day in a decade um, that you, you have to have resource adequacy standards for, to build for. So next slide. So some of these enabling technologies include storage, um, flexible loads that can include vehicle to grid, um, smart buildings, or flexible fuel production, um, which will be kind of talked about more in the next section on demand um, or transmission expansion. Um, it's important to note that storage um, comes in two types, long duration storage options and short duration storage options, which include batteries, um, whereas long duration storage includes things like um, hydrogen fuel stored underground, power to gas to power, pumped hydroelectricity and compressed air. And that batteries alone, um, current lithium ion batteries are not cost effective for seasonal storage um, and would have to come down a few orders of magnitude in cost in order to be used for seasonal storage um, uh, currently. So uh, although there are, um, there is a 150 hour duration battery being built in Minnesota by Form Energy, um, current lithium ion batteries are not cost effective for seasonal storage. Okay, so next slide. Um, so basically, in order to make reliable wind and solar based electricity systems more affordable, uh, one option is to add long duration energy storage, like I talked about, um, to reduce the cost of wind solar battery systems, or to add firm slash dispatchable generation. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, this long duration energy storage includes um, things that I mentioned before, pumped hydro, air, or, or hydrogen underground, um, and then firm or dispatchable generation includes those kind of clean, uh, clean technologies I mentioned before. So those would be our recommendations for states trying to meet um, renewable or clean targets. Um, they should add long duration energy storage or firm slash dispatchable generation in order to make wind and solar based electricity systems reliable and affordable. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie. So the next segment, we're going to talk about the demand for electricity. And this is uh, uh, the, the part of our larger team that led this it includes Megan Mounter from Stanford, Chris Castro from, uh, from Florida, uh, me and, and Morgan and uh, Megan and Chris are both tied up with other very important activities. And so uh, Morgan and I have been deputized to talk about, um, uh, about this topic. And I, just to give you a macro perspective here, um, I think one of the key messages out of Jackie's uh, presentation is that there are a lot of options on the supply side, including options that have very high technological ready list levels either now or could in the, in the proximate future. Um, and it looks highly likely that that future is going to be heavily renewabilized, plus a variety of investments to help firm those renewables. Long duration storage, uh, as her own work has uh, focused on in excellent ways, and then also clean firm power, which is really emerging from a lot of modeling community, a lot of modeling work as very, very important. And absent that, um, uh, the supply is going to be probably very low load factor, at least for now, uh, open cycle natural gas turbines. And that you see in the modeling work uh, that was presented yesterday will be presented in more detail in other kinds of settings. So that's the kind of picture on the supply side 
side where all else equal, you should expect a lot of variability in, uh, in, in supply. That says very important things about the, about the demand picture because it tells us we need to pay attention not only to demand overall, but it also means we have to pay very, very close attention to the shape of the demand curve um, and the potential responsiveness in that shape in the demand curve. So what we're gonna do is uh, over the next three slides is talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna say a few words about this and then I'm gonna uh, give the floor uh, back to Morgan uh, for additional remarks on, on, on the demand side. But if we go to the next slide, please. The first and I think maybe most important point to make is that over the last century, century a lot more than a century, the American economy, like all modern industrial economies, has autonomously electrified. It's gone from essentially 0% of primary energy converted into electricity before final consumption to a quarter or so of primary energy that's converted into uh, electricity before final consumption. Um, and then uh, that's flattened a bit uh, recently, but one of the clear implications of deep decarbonization is that there's gonna be additional electrification. More loads are gonna be electrified. Uh, that'll be conspicuous in buildings, uh, including with the role of uh, very important roles for heat pumps and a variety of other technologies. It'll be true in light duty transportation that's already evident, particularly evident uh, here in California, where we're going to go to uh, uh, essentially 100% uh, all new vehicle sales soon will be all electric and an infrastructure to support that. Um, that's going to generate additional demand uh, for, for primary energy consumed as, uh, via electricity as the energy carrier. That may be the route for, um, for heavy, uh, heavier transportation for freight and so on. Um, probably not the route for aircraft in the immediate future, but there might be other energy carriers like uh, hydrogen for aircraft, hydrogen for uh, some industrial processes, and also potentially a lot, a lot of industrial processes, including perhaps things like steel production that go to electricity as well. So key point here on this slide is um, over time, the economy has autonomously electrified and we uh, may well see a doubling or tripling of that electrification uh, over the, with the same pace of deep decarbonization uh, across the economy overall. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things we spent some time on in the report is looking at the question of which demands could be variable and could be shifted around uh, uh, in bulk or in response to market conditions. It's very hard to see how you go to an even more pervasive electrification uh, and a more variable supply on, elect on, on the uh, variable electric supply without also having more responsiveness on the demand side. And a lot of questions, uh, human behavioral questions about how responsive are people gonna be to price incentives and so on, um, especially as you move outside the commercial sector where you've got large loads run by professionals, very attentive to market conditions, to, to people at home who are you know, busy doing other things like raising the kids and uh, not paying attention, at least on, on, on a second by second basis to the uh, larger market conditions of the grid. Uh, but there's been all kinds of innovation to aggregate loads to make a load to, to make it possible for loads to be much more responsive and so on. And one of the great promises as we electrify the vehicle fleet is going to be a shifting uh, loads at, at different times of uh, different times of the day. So this happens to be an illustration from um, uh, the system we have here at UC San Diego. We run, I believe, by charge points measurements, uh, the largest charging network by volume, uh, uh, open open network in the in the United States. Um, and this is, this is an image taken just before the pandemic set in, uh, showing a typical week. So each colored line is a different day of the week. Uh, the, the blue and, and uh, um, uh, yellow lines in the bottom are weekend days, and the other lines are, are during the day. And what you see in our load profile is that uh, people show up at work, they plug in at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning, and they charge for uh, two to four hours, and then it tapers off very quickly. And that's in part because of our parking rules, which don't let you stay in a spot uh, more than four hours, and mainly because of convenience, because people show up at the office in the morning, they plug in, and they want to go do what they do during the day. This is a problem for our, uh, our grid as we become more dependent on solar, where the peak is later in the day. And so we're now actively looking at a lot of measures to create incentives to have people shift their load, their charging later in the day and so on. And this is an, a, one example of a whole class of things that will be necessary uh, as we make demand more responsive to a grid supply system that is itself also more, uh, more variable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, um, a summary of work done uh, comparing energy efficiency 
uh, measured in the broadest, uh, 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 in the broadest sense, energy intensity of, of whole economies. Um, what we've seen historically since the 1980s through 2010, uh, which is a relatively modest kind of 1% per year improvement in primary energy intensity and acceleration since the year, uh, since the year 2010, uh, which is pretty interesting and, and a lot of debate as to why that is. Uh, high energy prices in some parts of the world played a role. A lot of active investment by governments, including uh, directly as a result of the stimulus packages uh, in the last economic uh, crisis, where depending on how you measure, 10 to 15 percent of those stimulus packages, including here in the United States, where our stimulus packages, economic stimulus packages right now have essentially no spending around clean energy, but they might uh, you know, come January uh, or February. Um, and, and so we've seen a, a big increase that has helped slow the growth of uh, primary energy demand and electricity has played a big role in that. Not fast enough even to meet the IEA's um, uh, two degree or scenarios that are consistent with two degrees. And so part of what we do in the report is document a lot of areas where energy efficiency could play a much bigger role in particular energy efficiency throughout the electric power system. Because frankly, the more efficient you make uh, the consumption of electricity, not just the supply of electricity, but also the consumption of electricity, the, 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 the greater you reduce the uh, needed primary energy supply. So I wanna just pause for a moment and give the floor back uh, to Morgan Bazilian. Uh, for any further comments about the demand side before we go on to the next section, which will be the evolution of grid topology. Morgan? David, thanks very much. Um, I guess just to, 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 to support a couple of the things you said there very quickly before we move on, um, you know, th there has been a, a focus on energy efficiency for many decades, and um, it still has not uh, taken the place at, as a primary a focus of, of policy or even technological advances in the energy system. Um, but hopefully those things are changing with the advent of um, deeper electrification, uh, decarbonization as a, as a key driver. Um, you know, energy efficiency as a first fuel has been called out by um, almost all uh, energy models and systems from the IEA to others uh, uh, for, for a long time. Uh, the issues of digitalization and um, demand flexibility, as David said, are critical to, to its uh, piece in the power sector, um, keeping in mind that it's complicated, so it's not the same in all sectors, and that it has issues related to behavioral, behavioral and socioeconomics that um, call for specific policies and measures to, to address it. So with that, um, I... Let me just jump in. Moment, oh. uh, because it looks like Chris Castro is on the line here as well, who was one of the co-authors of this section. So I want to just quickly give the floor to Chris in case you have comments about the demand. Uh, the demand. David, session. I think he's out oh, there. Oh, there you go. Thank you, David and, and Morgan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in and out of uh, some important efforts here at the city of Orlando with, with our mayor regarding uh, our energy system. So exciting things happening. The one thing I would add is, um, you know, obviously there is an amazing opportunity for us to, to reinvest in the built environment and drive more energy efficiency as Morgan was alluding to. You know, we have a pretty inefficient system across, you know, across the board, uh, you know, from not just generation, but the transmission distribution all the way down to the site. And when you start to look at the amount of jobs that we have in this field, uh, I think a E2 report came out showing over 3.3 million jobs now in the clean energy space, many of those still in uh, trying to figure out how to reduce the demand. So for the most part, you know, we see energy efficiency as a significant economic driver and one that's going to be critical for us to ensure that we achieve the de decarbonization strategies. Chris, thanks very much. And thanks for all your, your, your efforts on behalf of uh, the report and, and the great work you're doing down in Florida. Um, so I'd like to just keep moving on. We're on a tight schedule and uh, turn the, the floor over to my friends, uh, Emery Genser from MIT and uh, Dan Kamen from Berkeley. Uh, the floor is yours on evolution in grid typology. Just trying to start the video, which looks like maybe you need to authorize from your side. 
uh, host to stop video. So until the host starts, let me just uh, thank uh, both Emre and also Payment as well. It's it's really a pleasure to work with with this team. Um, if you can again start the video there, that'd be great. But maybe not working. So let me just move to the next slide, please. Uh, if you can hear me, just okay. So um, so. As you yeah, heard before, Dan, we can, Dan, we can hear you loud and clear. And I don't great, know what's okay, going. yeah, just the videos looks like it stopped, so that's fine. So, um, just as you heard before, prices um, for renewables are falling dramatically. And when we think about the grid, there's really two very exciting, dramatic areas. One is this graph just illustrates the systemic change with the coal sector um, plunging and the renewables rising, and obviously what takes place in. Um, in gas is something we'll talk about in a little bit as we go forward. But in terms of thinking about um, enabling large scale clean energy, both for stationary power and for the vehicle issues you mentioned before, it does suggest two very important uh, structural changes are both needed and also opportunities. And so in the next slide, let me just highlight as we think about new projects that will go in anywhere in the country, and this is essentially the geographic version of what you saw before. So if we think about projects with their overnight cost, with no cost of carbon at all, um, just looking at a, at a map across the country, if you just advance the slide, you'll see the color coding that highlights the rust colored areas are where natural gas is today the cheapest uh, form of energy. There's a small pocket where nuclear is the least cost. Um, this is the University of Texas calculator you can all utilize. They actually do some sort of interesting work on how they think about the, the waste management costs. But really I wanna draw your attention to the large swaths of green where wind power is the least cost in the middle of the country, Appalachia and New York state. And then the mauve or purple where solar is the least cost both in the Southwest and some other areas. And of course, this is the world, this is the national map. Um, it varies state by state. We of course do have carbon prices in the New England, the Reggie region, as well in California. And if we advance to that next slide um, where we hit the California price, if that was applied nationwide, you can see that really the big change is that solar has advanced dramatically to kind of be co-equal with wind along the lines that Jackie said, and gas is being relegated um, more and more to smaller and smaller parts of the country. And I, I say this and highlight it as we think about the demands for the grid, not so much to make an argument for carbon pricing. In fact, if you just advance the next slide, I'm, I'm explicitly not making an argument for carbon pricing. I'm really illustrating that Many regional policies already have constraints on local air pollution, particulates water pollution. And so in many ways, a carbon price is a proxy for a variety of other, of other issues. But what it does really speak to for the grid are two things. One is there are regional advantages for different technologies to play larger roles in different parts of the country. And that's gonna highlight a need for some thinking about grid integration between regions, something that our report brings out pretty clearly. And also the last point that I'll, I'll come to, and that's really about smart systems. So if we move to the next slide, um, what we've seen now is a whole series of reports, which we review in this one, that highlight the advantages of power trading and transfers between RTOs, the regional power organizations, and some of the real needs and opportunities to shuttle power within our regions, the, the MISO, the upper Midwest, the, um, the East Coast regions, Texas, Zircot, and the West. And what you find more and more is that the benefits of investing in larger amounts of renewables with higher amounts of reliability really do come by having a grid that enables these power transfers. And that's everything from meeting current demand to being able to move power in and out of some of our large demand regions on the Atlantic coast, some of the big um, central cities, um, Chicago and others, and then along the West Coast. And this is very important to think about because transmission projects are some of the slowest and hardest to build consortiums to put together due to the long construction times. And so there's really exciting and important work to be done that links between regional carbon plans, such as in the states that have already adopted 100% targets, as you heard before from Jackie, um, but also in the opportunities to now think very differently as we integrate in new forms of renewables. And that's everything from building out more solar and wind in areas where the resource is great and then transmitting power to areas where the demand is great. 
to significant new opportunities and perhaps a rise of geothermal and certainly the plans underway for offshore wind highlight new grid demands. In fact, on the West Coast of the United States, California, which has a peak demand of around 45 gigawatts, is actually talking about plans now to build upwards of 10 gigawatts over the next decade. So that really highlights the need for the work at the state level with the public utilities commissions, and in particular that of the FERC, so that we can enable these clean energy transfers to be both good business models and both good opportunities for coordination within the regions. And it really speaks to some very dramatic and very exciting opportunities that this report highlights um, at very high uh, um, technological readiness levels um, over this coming decade. That's really on the physical grid side where we think about moving power around and taking advantage of some of the big existing lines that formerly moved uh, primarily coal or large hydropower. But the last slide I'll show really highlights the other part of that transformation, and that is as much as we will need investments and acceleration of grid topography changes to bring some of the areas of exceptionally low cost renewables, um, parts of the Southwest have prices well under two cents and amazingly now even under one cent per kilowatt hour if one takes advantage of some of those, those opportunities to really what uh, many of us predict will be the big new innovation for the decade and that is to really think about a smart integrated grid of grids or an internet of things as is the language in some parts of the story and that is to enable everything from large producers to integrate with either geographically nearby or not so nearby energy storage to thinking about businesses and homes as not producers only or consumers only but prosumers integrated producers and consumers so that almost everyone can be thinking about the grid as not only a clean energy resource, but an income generation resource. And that's not just for big companies and affluent homeowners. It's really an opportunity to invest in social equity and environmental justice. And so the degree to which this transformation of the US power grid to one that is clean and more reliable, and we definitely think about more reliability even in California where we're uh, still dealing with blackouts. But this report highlights the degree to which we can think about this as an industrial um, transformation tool, but one that is co-equal on social justice and equity as clean energy. And I think that if anything comes out of this section, it's really that opportunity is tremendous. And this report goes into a lot of the details of these smart enabled grid of grids. And let me pass it back to, to David, but to thank you all for being on at this kind of moment of transition. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. And I just want to emphasize um, uh, right where you ended there, which is um, this is a, an enormous potential in, in, in transformation electric power sector, the sector that already is making, um, frankly, the most progress in terms of decarbonization. Yet one of the big challenges here is that the policy is diffused. There are 3,300 enterprises responsible for the electric power system in the United States. There are much of it is regulated at state level, some of it's regulated at the federal level, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, some of it's affected by investment policies, our D&D policies. And so uh, any kind of policy strategy is intrinsically uh, kind of chaotic, if you like, and decentralized. Uh, Gernot Wagner and Brian Tura uh, led the section uh, uh, on policy, and Brian is with us today, is going to talk about um, some of the key messages from that. And then we will make sure that 15 minutes past the hour, no later, that we allow for some questions. And so those of you who have questions, there have been some coming in already, please put them into the chat box and uh, we will get as many answered as possible. Brian, the floor is yours. Awesome. Hi everyone, thank you for sticking around. And I'm glad to wrap up this section of the Power webinar by talking about steering the process and the roles of policies and markets. So next slide, please. So the first thing I wanted to say is that there's a lot of different policy instruments that are available for you know, helping us progress towards full decarbonization of the electric power supply. There's a robust, a robust set of debates and discussions that, go, that are going on about the effectiveness of these different policy instruments, um, their pros and cons. And we take the standpoint that there are different instruments that exist, but none are individually sufficient for meeting decarbonization goals. And that's because the effectiveness of a given policy instrument 
will depend on your theory of change. So we're not going to, in this session, recommend preferred policy instruments or compare policy instruments against each other. Rather, what we set out to do is to identify key considerations for the development of a suite of policies for decarbonizing the power supply that put us along a no regrets pathway. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that terminology, a no regrets pathway means that even if all the policies don't work exactly as fully as intended, that we still have a high probability of meeting our goal of full power decarbonization while avoiding unintended consequences. So next slide, please. So when you evaluate a policy instrument, we identify three dimensions. First is the environmental effectiveness. And this is really what it means at the end of the day, how much does a given policy instrument when implemented progress us in absolute terms towards full decarbonization of the power supply, right? That's, this is decarbonization, so that's naturally very important. However, there's the second dimension of economic efficiency, where instead of looking at absolute effectiveness, economic efficiency focuses on cost effectiveness. So what's the amount of progress, however you define that, toward full decarbonization that you get per unit of, or per unit of economic investment that you spend on this policy for so on. Then the third dimension is political efficacy, because in order to make these policies have their intended effect, they have to gain popular and political support among the constituents and the bodies that will be voting on and implementing them, right? So any policy instrument, whether it's a carbon tax or a mandate or so on and so forth, involves trade-offs among these dimensions. And it's important to note that where a given policy instrument falls with respect to these dimensions can change and will change over time. So next slide, please. So three categories of policy instruments that we identified. First is direct regulation, and you see these in the forms of mandates and standards. So a good example is the renewable portfolio standards that have been implemented in different parts of the state, or a clean energy standard, which is something that people are discussing. The second class is market instruments, where instead of mandating from the top down, market instruments aim to provide price incentives and interventions in the structure of markets to move the market preferred quote unquote composition of technologies to be comprised more and more of decarbonizing technologies. And the third class we identify as technological interventions. Now this involves direct or indirect subsidies or industrial policies and technological interventions differ from the first two classes in the sense that technological interventions are focused on promoting the deployment of specific technologies that the policy designer feels is going to be a major part of the decarbonization effort. So an example of this would be production tax credits, say for wind and solar technologies. Next slide, please. So we are gonna talk about three focus areas that the suite of policies, whatever it ends up being, has to consider, and a couple of other points that are important as well, in order to that we feel will put us on a no regrets pathway towards power decarbonization. And the first focus area is the suite of policies has to promote investment to better enable the electricity system to integrate decarbonizing technologies. And where this comes from is the fact that our you know, economic market and also regulatory frameworks for how the electricity system operates and how it absorbs and integrates new technologies has been based on the characteristics and business models of incumbent technologies. A good example of this is how electricity markets are based on compensating generators for their marginal costs of electricity, right? But in the future, if you have a large amount of your system comprised of zero marginal cost resources like wind and solar, that structure doesn't really work um, quite as well. So that needs to change. So a question that needs to be answered is how to repurpose or restructure the classic rate of return regulations and, and market structures to better enable progress towards decarbonization goals. Next question, please, or next slide, sorry. Second consideration is that policies need to incentivize the adoption of existing decarbonization technologies and practices. Now there's a lot of focus on new technologies and I'll get to that in a bit, but there's a lot of technologies that are out there commercially ready and really need to get put into the ground at large scale to ramp up our decarbonization effort. And these are things that we are able to do today and policies need to promote that. So examples could be emissions pricing to affect dispatch or subsidies for technologies that are commercially available or you know, shovel ready, so to speak. Next slide, please. A third focus area is that in parallel to the deployment of, of current technologies, policies also need to incentivize fundamental innovation and adoption of new technologies to support momentum for deep decarbonization in the long term. 
So there's a lot of studies that talk about with current of currently available technologies, we can get very, very far towards full decarbonization of the power supply and you know, potentially beyond into other sectors. But not quite to 100%, and especially once you start talking about decarbonizing other sectors by connecting with electricity, um, there needs to be a bit more innovation and new technologies or the technologies need to come down in cost in order to carry out that follow through to full decarbonization. So policies that incentivize fundamental innovation and adoption of these new technologies allow these technologies to drive down their cost and learn how to improve themselves by doing so that they will be ready for implementation by the point that we need them in our decarbonization journey. Next slide, please. Another important point is the role of co-benefits. It's important that policies provide benefits that speak to a wider base of people rather than instead of just people whose primary concern is climate, right? So these are things like air quality benefits, water supply benefits, um, economic near-term economic benefits. Policies that have this wider base of appeal will gain more political and popular support than policies that only emphasize the climate angle, right? So it's also important that these co-benefits center in providing tangible benefits for demographics that have been disproportionately burdened by the environmental impacts of the current electricity system. So next slide, please. Another point is that in order for this momentum for deep decarbonization to be consistent and to follow through all the way, um, public sector r and spending needs to increase. Historical spending has largely been flat. And if we want that if we want deep decarbonization to become a reality, this is going to have to ramp up. Now, over time, what that gets spent on may change, but there needs to be a base of public sector RD&D spending in order to ensure that this momentum carries through to full decarbonization. Next slide, please. So the bottom line is in order to develop a no regrets pathway, there's a lot of considerations that the suite of policies we end up implementing has to take into account, right? And this these include things that have a wide appeal, a wide benefit that are politically efficate and actually make good progress toward decarbonization. And at, make sure that these policies avoid lock-ins that can derail our pathway towards full decarbonization. So at the end of the day, we need a no regrets pathway. And you know, there's a lot of discussion about what that will look like, but these are things to consider. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Brian. So we're, we are a well-oiled machine. We are right on schedule, and that means we have time for some questions. And I'm going to put the first question that's in the chat box from Sad. I'll watch. I'll watch her. I'm going to put it to Emre Genser from MIT. And I'm curious, Emre, if you could say a few words, in particular, about the role of carbon capture and storage, the value of carbon capture and storage. Um, it seems like we've been talking a lot about that for a long time. When you look in the real world, not a lot of projects. Uh, the role for this in, in natural gas, in particular, could be very high, uh, and yet. We see, you know, not a lot of projects. So I'm, uh, how should we think about the role of CCS, the pivotal nature or not of CCS, uh, as we try to integrate more renewables on the grid and decarbonize the grid overall? And all of our panelists, by the way, can turn on their video so that we have a full splendor of uh, Hollywood squares here. Emre, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think this is a great question. And so I think we should think about carbon capture more than for just power sector. So carbon capture is really an important instrument for uh, decarbonizing the hard to electrify sectors like industry and other applications. But even for power plants, uh, we shouldn't only think about U uh, America and US for the power system. So for developing countries where there is a huge uh, new fleet of coal power plants as well as natural gas power plants, the only way to decarbonize power system will be carbon capture for the next decade or so. And even in the US, carbon capture can uh, help uh, continue using the existing assets and prevent some early retirement. So I really believe that there's a place for carbon capture and we shouldn't ignore when we are moving towards a decarbonized energy system. Excellent, thank you very much. So, and by the way, when I ask the next question, we're gonna do some shameless promotion. We're gonna put up a slide for the next webinars that follow ours, just so you can have a sense of the landscape is um so so uh, and they're all it's very american a lot of flags um uh, the next one is on transportation uh, uh tomorrow but um i'm a question in the chat box here from from david lee 
Uh, D David, very nice to see you and uh, see you at least electronically. Um, and I want to put this question maybe to Jackie. Um, it seems to me that there's, if I kind of interpret David's question here, uh, he's asking us questions about the relationship between zero carbon power, clean firm power and storage. And I'm curious, Jackie, as to how we should think about the relative value of the two, because you emphasize in your remarks, the value of storage seems to me that other literature is, is particularly underscoring the value of clean firm power and saying, you know, kind of storage really can't do it all because you have these multi-day periods when, when uh, we have uh, renewables droughts. H how should we think about that question? And then if other panelists want to comment on this, because it's a very important topic, just raise your hand figuratively or electronically, and I'll bring in a little conversation on this topic before we go to the next question. But first, I want to give the floor to you, Jackie. Yeah, so I, I think again, just recapping that there's really two kinds of storage um, functional roles, the short duration storage and long duration storage, and that it's the short duration storage that can't meet these large gaps, but that long duration storage can. Um, but uh, the firm or clean um, uh, generators such as hydronuclear, those have been shown to um, in literature to decrease the cost of um, electric um, of clean electricity systems, but a lot of them have um, various other constraints such as um, like high costs or or um, ecosystem problems like with hydro or um, things like nuclear where it um, there's a lot of um, time and money going into um, building them. Um, and so I think uh, it kind of depends on uh, what the state's goal is, I guess. Um, if they're going for 100% renewable, um, they could supplement wind and solar electricity systems with long duration storage, um, and that would reduce costs. But if they're going for 100% clean, then they should supplement with um, hydro or nuclear or geothermal as they have access to those resources. But um, both long duration storage and these firm generators um, uh, have certain uh, geographic requirements. And so it's going to be different for different states. And so the states should really look at um, what they have access to in their area and then make decisions about what they'll use to supplement the wind and solar. So basically, you need something to supplement wind and solar electricity systems. and. Um, it's going to be different for different states what they will use to supplement wind and solar, but just batteries is not enough to make it affordable. So you need something else too. Thank you very much. And I, I've been working with a, a local organization here on a big pumped hydro project. And it's interesting because the value proposition is very clear and yet just putting the deal together and getting the regulatory support and so on, that stuff is very, very hard to do indeed. So I'm gonna uh, go in just a moment to, to Morgan and ask him to help us get very practical about what we do over the next one, two, three years to put ZCAP into practice. But I just wanna draw out, underscore something that Brian said in his remarks, um, which is that in effect, what we're doing what we're talking about across the economy, but especially in the electric power sector is to moving to an even more capital intensive, this is one of the most capital intensive sectors of the economy, even more capital intensive away from operating costs. And in that world, getting the policy environment right and stable is unbelievably important because it affects the cost of capital and the risks associated with that. And I think we're going to see a big, when we turn to the kind of brass tacks of policy, we're going to see a big emphasis on that. We're also going to see a big emphasis on R&D. You know, depending on which estimates you look at, we might be underfunding by a factor of three, maybe more than a factor of three, um, R&D. And so I think you're going to see uh, with the new stimulus package, there's a lot of emphasis on energy, an awful lot of attention as there was in 2009 to, to, to our d and issues. I want to put the question to you, Morgan. Maybe you could say a little bit about, okay, so everyone believes us. Uh, what do you do over the next one, two, three years to start to turn some of these ideas uh, into, into, into reality? Thanks, David. I'll keep it very brief for a rather... Uh expansive question, but that in this chapter, we focused on the, the, the power sector um, and took roughly a technocratic uh, view of it, which is very common in, in these kind of exercises and looked at things like specific policies, uh, regulations like clean energy standards or, or mechanisms like supporting RD&D, um, moving 
uh, to electrification and, and, and addressing the defragmentation in the power sector you described. Uh, I, I'd also just like to highlight that other chapters in the report looked at per, what I think are, are, are perhaps the more important issues, uh, and you just referenced one of them in social license to operate, which are the socio-economic aspects of this socio-technical system we're, we're concerned about. And so issues of equity and just transitions and social license to operate are gonna be absolutely fundamental to making any uh, positive um, change in the short term or the long term uh, over this. And there, like I said, there is a chapter on uh, focused on jobs in, in this report and, and some others that touch on those subjects. Um, and uh, Dan just ran a session on this earlier today that I was part of, but th th those are some of the, the, the key aspects, I think, of, of making this uh, viable in the short term. So I want to uh, I want to pick up on the jobs issue. I want to put a question to Dan about that, and then in a little bit I'm going to uh, uh, lay out a different question about collaboration between companies and governments, and so I'm going to try and get Chris Castro in on that. But first, let me go to you, Dan. There's a question uh, in the chat box from Greer Gosnell about jobs, and in particular, picking up on the issue that you raised about uh, allocation of jobs, diversity in jobs, and so on. Uh, to put it bluntly, it seems like a, a lot of the jobs we're talking about here are jobs for white men. Uh, and I'm just curious as to what we know about the diversity in jobs, whether, whether and how we need to be more attentive to that. If, if a big part of this play is going to be not just kind of decarbonization, but a variety of co-benefits, including on the employment front. Dan? Yeah, I think this is a critical question. And the old stock answer has been for many years, there's more jobs in energy efficiency and clean energy than dirty energy but they're not equitably distributed. And we've seen in reports that many groups have done, including mine, that even when you think you kind of have a better approach, we're gonna to try to promote solar at the community level, that frequently those jobs go to pre-existing, often white run environmental groups. And so the next stage of this is really gonna to have to link efforts at the local level, really promoting local groups, but also with a big hand up, um, in terms of federal agencies at the FERC, at the EPA, at HUD and elsewhere, to look at how do you essentially see these companies much more equitably so that the benefits really do fall, not just to the end users, but to building companies and, 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 and activities in location. We've got some really interesting examples. Michigan, for example, has a very, very successful program in place um, that has been a real a nice push for clean energy. It's called Michigan Saves. And it's one that's invested in minority owned companies really putting the benefits where they are. And I think one piece is also to recognize the lessons that were that were that really came out of the clean power plan under the Obama administration. And that's not a roadmap to what to do in the future, but clean power plan essentially said that states are gonna compete against themselves to get cleaner, not to compete against other states and that there needed to be equal investment in job training programs and efforts to move people um, from, for example, oil and gas into also geothermal and hydrogen and areas where the expertise really folds over. And those are efforts to really make these programs much more equitable, not just along racial grounds, but also around red state, blue state to make this much more of a national jobs program. And since we know the jobs are there, the, the next task will be to make them equitably distributed. And it's something that can be done, but it's gonna take some thoughtful coordination between local and federal actions. Excellent, thank you very much. Time for one or two more questions. I wanna put the next one from Adam Fuller to Chris Castro. So Adam's question is about this observation that, that there's a lot, a big role in the transportation sector, a big role in the power sector, and there's more collaboration or potential for collaboration across the two. But Adam's really, I think, pointing to a larger issue, which is what are the kinds of, corporate partnerships or government corporate partnerships um, that, that you see being on the front lines in a city that's tackling these issues that you see as of paramount importance? Well, you know, first of all, I'll say that cities are going to be a major catalyst for implementation of this plan, right? We're seeing that with things like the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, C40 Cities, and the like. And little by little, we're starting to create policies and various programs that are driving forward action in efficiency on the building side, 
decarbonization and, and renewables, primarily rooftop solar in many of our cities, uh, and now getting into storage, and then electric vehicles and electrification. Uh, um, in terms of partnerships, we have really built a network, at least in Orlando, on uh, uh, connecting with not only transit uh, and our utility, but also the airports, academia, and the business community to begin driving forward kind of a, a culture of needing to address this in a meaningful way. And I think if, if we're not creating uh, those pathways for partnerships, it's difficult. You know, just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, our utility uh, just came out with some news about our decarbonization plants officially committing to net zero by 2050 uh, with intermittent pathways of 50% by 2030 and 75 by 2040. Um, and also early retiring uh, to coal-fired power plants, uh, probably at least 20 to 30 years before they could have been. And I think we're beginning to see that the policy drivers that we have imposed by committing to 100% renewables at the city side and working with our hometown utility to work through the modeling, the actual integrated resources plan to identify you know, the, the technical way to get there um, has driven some really interesting you know, partnerships and, and learnings from that. Uh, we're also about to tomorrow unveil our first round of electric buses going into our downtown BRT. And uh, it's the first of 14, which will complete uh, our, our, you know, our downtown transit. But we have a goal of 100% uh, you know, electric and alternative fuel for the public transit. And through the utility, we're, we're now uh, you know, using on-bill financing to subsidize the upfront uh, cost for the infrastructure on the utility side. And, and then you know, have working together to share the cost for the buses and the operations of this service for people who come and visit, work, and, and, and learn in, in our city. Um, so there are some important partnerships with academia, with utility, uh, with all the stacks of government. You can imagine that Florida is in one of those states that uh, are looked at upon as, as a leader in, in, in clean energy, quite frankly. But uh, because of the partnerships locally, we've been able to really excel and, and create a model for many others. And there are so many cities around this country that are truly driving and accelerating the clean energy economy and, and this decarbonization plan. Another chapter in this, uh, in this plan also touches upon those policies and encourage everybody to check those out. Excellent, thank you very much. And this team at Brookings put a study out last week showing that half the cities now are quite doing quite a lot, you know, kind of very, we need to learn better which of these policies are working and not. And there's a question in the chat box about which countries have the cleanest grids some of them have the cleanest grids, not for carbon reasons, just kind of accidental reasons, especially countries with big hydro systems, uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, Swiss grids, very clean, mainly hydro, some nuclear. Um, but I think the experience you're having, LA has had, a bunch of other places have had, where you're closing conventional coal plants, th th these are the places that are now actually demonstrating the most impact numerically because of the high baseline and then the active effective policy. I wanna give the floor to close here. We're out of time and so, but we still have a few questions. We answered many of them. Um, we wanna do a little shameless promotion on the way out, put that slide back up about our upcoming uh, uh, webinars. I wanna give the floor to Morgan Bazilian to say a, a final couple words uh, on behalf of our team, Morgan. David, thank you very much. Um, so it's uh, down to me just to, 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 to thank uh, everyone who, who joined us today, thank all of the, the authors and co-authors in the report. Thank you, David, for your leadership. I'd also like to mention uh, Cheyenne Maddox and Elena Creech, who have been tire, tirelessly working to, to make sure this all comes together, uh, as well as the leadership and vision of Jeff Sachs and Dan Esty and others on, 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 at, at the, the board of this um, project. So uh, I believe the slides for this will be uh, public and there are numerous resources uh, that you can find on the sdsnusa.org website. Um, and thank you again for joining us and hope uh, you, you enjoyed the presentation and take a close look at the material. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, have a nice day. <laughs>